This is Standing Watch. And now, Evangelist Norbert Link. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our Standing Watch program. In March of 2013, a new pope was elected, Pope Francis, after Pope Benedict had resigned in an unparalleled endeavor in light of recent historical events. What can we expect from Pope Francis? And what can we expect from the Catholic Church? Now, I'd like to go back and take you back in time to February of 2013. And I'd like to quote to you from an article by the BBC News dated February 28, 2013, as to what Benedict has said. That's how he is quoted. Pope Benedict has vowed unconditional obedience and reverence to his eventual successor. And so he made it very clear, even though he didn't know who his successor would be, that he would have unconditional surrender to his successor. And of course, he expected of all Catholics to do the same. The Guardian wrote on August 21 as to why Benedict resigned. At least that's what he said. The former Pope Benedict has claimed that his resignation in February was prompted by God, who told him to do it during a mystical experience. And then he goes on to say that by that time he didn't know exactly as to why that was, but now, after witnessing the charisma of his successor, Pope Francis, Benedict said he understood to a greater extent how his stepping aside was the will of God. And of course, Pope Francis has become extremely popular, almost like a rock star, not just within the Catholic Church, but also around the world, I almost want to say. Now, here is an interesting article telling you why, according to the testimony of an archbishop, Pope Francis was elected in the first place. The Telegraph wrote on May 14, 2013, that the surprise election of Pope Francis came about because of a series of supernatural signs. Cardinal Christoph Schönbrunn, or, or Schönborn, I should say, the Archbishop of Vienna, said that he had personally had two strong signs that Cardinal Giorgi Mario Bergoglio was a chosen one in the run-up vote. And it shouldn't come as any surprise that subsequently the left liberal magazine Time elected Pope Francis as the man of the year. And this happened, of course, in December of 2013. And here's one interesting quote from an article explaining as to why he was elected. Churches report a Francis effect of lapsed Catholics returning to mass and confession. The fascination with Francis even outside his flock gives him an opportunity that his predecessor never had to, notice carefully, magnify the message of the church and its power. And Pope Francis apparently is doing anything and everything he can to make himself popular. And so he made some very interesting statements regarding the gay community. AFP wrote on January 5, 2014, that Pope Francis has called for a rethink in the way the Catholic Church deals with the children of gay couples. In July, he reached out to gays, declaring that if someone is gay and seeks the Lord with goodwill, who am I to judge? And so in December, following Times Magazine's vote to make him the Man of the Year, the Advocate Magazine, which is dedicated to the gay and lesbian community, chose the head of the Catholic Church as a single most influential person of 2013 on the lives of gays and lesbians. It's interesting that Die Welt wrote on January 7, 2014, that many men of the Catholic Swiss Guards have been allegedly approached by priests, bishops, and cardinals. In its article, The Vatican is a Paradise for Gays, the paper wrote that the Swiss Guard has been protecting the Pope and the Vatican for 500 years, but that the 110 men troop has also been serving as a lust object. So Pope Francis is dealing with a situation, apparently even within the Catholic Church, which, again, doesn't make the whole situation very popular. However, however, 
he is trying to replace more conservatives with more liberal cardinals. The New York Times wrote on January 13 that the mood inside the Vatican ranges from adulation to uncertainty to deep anxiety, even a touch of paranoia. They whisper about six mysterious Jesuit spies who act as the Pope's eyes and ears on the Vatican grounds. However, as we know, Pope Francis, of course, is a Jesuit himself. The article also says that Francis remains tricky to define, a doctrinal conservative whose humble style and symbolic gestures have thrilled many liberals. But we have to understand that he is a conservative, and he will not depart from the core doctrines of the Catholic Church. For instance, Newsmax wrote on January 13, 2014, that Pope Francis, whom conservatives in the Roman Catholic Church have accused of not speaking out forcefully enough against abortion, on Monday calls the practice horrific. And of course, the Catholic Church treats abortion as murder, and they are correct in that regard. Here's another article by The Local, dated October 10, 2013, saying that the Vatican pledged on Thursday to take action against a German diocese which gives out Holy Communion to Catholic divorcees who have remarried. So in other words, that old Catholic teaching that you can never divorce and then get remarried is being upheld by the Pope. Now, that's a teaching which is wrong in accordance to biblical standards. The Guardian reported on July 16, 2013, that in its latest attempt to keep up the times, the Vatican has married one of its oldest traditions to the world of social media by offering indulgences to followers of Pope Francis' tweets. The Church's granted indulgences reduce the time Catholics believe they will have to spend in purgatory after they have confessed and have been absolved of their sins. Now, again, another totally wrong concept, which the Catholic Church is famous for. A belief in purgatory, that the souls go to purgatory after a person dies, and if you then have those indulgences, then the soul can come out of purgatory earlier to go to heaven. A wrong idea, not biblical, but of course the Pope upholds it. He also upholds the worship of the Virgin Mary, quote-unquote, believes in so-called apparitions of the Virgin Mary, believes in the worship and adoration of saints, all of these things totally contrary to the teachings of the Bible. Now, here's an article by BBC News going back to November 26, 2013, talking about his background. It says, born in Argentina, Pope Francis is the first Latin American and the first Jesuit to lead the Roman Catholic Church. The order of the Jesuits, it says, became so powerful that it was suppressed at the end of the 18th century, but later restored. As a Jesuit, he is a member of perhaps the most powerful and experienced religious order of the Catholic Church, who are known as expert communicators. It appears that few who know him doubt his conservative credentials. Now, of course, we also find that the Roman Catholic Church is not very, very prone to reveal an awful lot about the ongoing sex scandals. There's an article by the Associated Press dated January 11, 2014, saying that the Vatican has told Polish prosecutors that its former ambassador to the Dominican Republic under investigation for alleged sex abuse is covered by diplomatic immunity and that the Vatican doesn't extradite its citizens. So they refuse to have him extradited. Of course, this was a very and is a very high-ranking priest in the Catholic's hierarchy. Now, but what I like to bring your attention to is the fact that we can expect more and more the Catholic Church's involvement under Pope Francis in political matters. There is an article by Newsmax dated April 30, 2013, that Israeli President Shimon Peres warned Pope Francis Tuesday that the Middle East is disintegrating and that the pontiff has an important role to play in bringing peace to the region and the world. It goes on to say that this was stated that the Pope's leadership creates a new spirit of hope for peace, of dialogue between nations, and of the promotion of a solution to global poverty. Now, President or Chancellor Merkel, German Chancellor Merkel, met with the Pope 
in May of 2013, and the mass tabloid Bild wrote on May 18 that the two key figures for the future of Europe seem to have found a good connection, and that not only in just a few similarities, and it says that Angela Merkel stated that the Catholic Church has a central role in light of the Christian roots of Europe. We also find that Pope Francis took a stand towards Syria. He wrote a letter to Vladimir Putin asking him to exert some influence that there would not be any military intervention in Syria, and it appears like he was at least partially successful. He also is trying to connect again with the Russian Orthodox Church. And finally, we find that U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, according to an article by JTA of January 14, 2014, asked the Vatican to intercede in helping free American Jewish contractor Alan Gross from a Cuban jail. Kerry is the first Catholic U.S. Secretary of State in more than 30 years. And then they also discussed other matters, including Syria, including a peace treaty between Israel and Palestine, the Palestinians. As we look at all these events, and we are thinking in terms of biblical prophecy, we know that the time will come when two very powerful leaders will arise on the world scene, a political leader and a religious leader. We have several booklets prepared, one about the book of Revelation. Another one is entitled The Ten European Revivals of the Ancient Roman Empire, which gives you a lot more information as to what the Bible predicts is going to happen. Now, when these two figures manifest themselves on the world scene, we've got to understand that they are not being brought there by God, but they are coming with the power of Satan. It is very important that we watch and pray, because when they arrive, the Great Tribulation will begin. We need to watch and to pray that we are counted worthy, that our eyes be opened, and that we can escape all the things which are prophesied to happen, and to stand in front of the Son of Man, because when these two figures manifest themselves, the return of Jesus Christ is very, very near. I pray that God will show you what is going to happen, when it is happening, and that he will get you out of this modern Babylon of confusion. I thank you very much for listening. This is Norbert Link for the Standing Watch program. Standing Watch is a presentation by The Church of the Eternal God, P.O. Box 270519, San Diego, California, 92198. More information is also available at our website, eternalgod.org.